The next panel is led by Scott Pace. He's the director of the Space Policy Institute here at the George Washington University. And for us, it is a longtime collaborator with Explore Mars because it was at the Space Policy Institute that we first held our conference here in Washington, a conference that wasn't about humans to Mars. It was about the use of the ISS and Mars. And um, it is uh, so with very great pleasure that uh, I am able to announce him here because for us, this is a you know, this is a hometown and a home match, even if our company at the moment is established in Beverly, Massachusetts. Now, Scott will introduce his panel, and uh, I think we'll, he will give us an interesting conversation about space exploration at the George Washington University. Yeah. Scott. I can't even tell how many people are here. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, and uh, welcome everyone. This is the this is the really hardcore crowd, the one that lasts till uh, till the uh, ending panels, and uh, so we thank you for that. And uh, we have actually some really other great speakers uh, closing up uh, with some uh, real energy at the end. Alan Stern, Rick Tummelson, um, who uh, will give us a charge uh, at the uh, at the end of the day. Uh, first of all, I want, in addition to welcoming you here to uh, George Washington University. Uh, I wanted to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, the number of space-related or Mars-related things uh, that happen at GW. Uh, so we're not uh, you know, Purdue or MIT or places like that, although we have graduates from those places. Uh, but by dint of our location uh, here in Washington and a result of some of the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary work uh, that routinely occurs across the university, uh, we have uh, a number of experts uh, who've made their home here at GW and I want to have them talk a little bit about uh, what they do. Uh, they're associated with the Space Policy Institute, which is part of the Elliott School of uh, International Affairs. Uh, so our space activities, our space policy activities take an intrinsically uh, international approach. Uh, we have on the uh, panel uh, uh, Dr. Henry Hertzfeld, who's a notable economist and lawyer and a specialist in space law. Uh, Dr. Pascal Onfreund, um, who is a research professor and who had a, a small satellite uh, that flew into space looking at uh, testing of organic molecules in space. And with uh, due respect to our engineering colleagues, I love bragging at sessions that the Elliott School has a small satellite in space and we're waiting for engineering colleagues to catch up. Sorry. And uh, we have also Zoe Zenfaber, uh, Faber, who uh, is from the uh, Engineering <coughs> Management System Engineering School, uh, who has a, a, a quite interesting laboratory looking at technical innovation uh, she's a graduate, uh, a doctorate from MIT, and uh, Chris, Dr. Chris Linhard, who is a medical doctor uh, who works in the emergency uh, room here. You never want to see him outside of this setting, believe me, uh, but in the School of Medicine and Health Science and teaches our aerospace medicine course. So law, economics, uh, engineering, science, medicine, policy, uh, these are all the, um, the topics that uh, we try to cover. And of course, many of you know us from uh, the founder of the Space Policy Institute, uh, Dr. John Logston, uh, who essentially created the field of uh, space policy uh, and for some of his seminal work in space history, uh, the decision to go to the moon originally. Uh, he's currently finishing a book on uh, the Nixon administration, decisions regarding the space shuttle and sort of a post-Apollo uh, program that will be uh, very exciting when it comes out. Uh, with that, I'd like to then turn over to uh, Dr. Henry Hertzfeld. Uh, to talk about a little bit about his work uh, being done here at uh, GW. Thanks, Scott. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, of course. I mean, usually, we've been talking mostly about Mars in terms of science, engineering, how to get there, but not so sure that you really want to hear about law at the moment. So I will raise some questions and issues and talk fairly generally because uh, many of these things are, will be uh, questions that will have to be answered at one point or another, but uh, we won't get there unless we solve some of these issues as well. First of all, in space law, we have a number of treaties 
Uh, four basic ones and a moon agreement. Um, question is, do the treaties say anything about Mars? Do they say we can't or we can go there? The answer is there's nothing, nothing at all, that prohibits us from going to Mars in the space treaties. In fact, they are organized uh, for exploration, for scientific purposes, for freedom of access, for international cooperation, uh, and of course, underlying all of them for peaceful purposes. Uh, but there are a couple of issues that will come up which we'll have to deal with. One is there's a provision in the Outer Space Treaty that says no nation may declare sovereignty in space or, or, or on any celestial body. People, when they go somewhere, want to own things. We do not have a solution to how we handle that yet, but there are many ways that we can uh, address this issue without a serious problem. The set, another one concerns the Moon Agreement, and I'll come back to that in a minute. The, um, we do have some problems, though. There are major regulatory differences depending on whether a government is doing the uh, project, whether a private company is, or in some sort of partnership, be it partnership between governments and companies or international cooperative partnerships. Issues of liability if something goes wrong and to define and figure out activities performed on Mars. Are we going there for science? Are some uh, companies going there to make a profit? How do we handle these uh, issues? And all the treaties deal, including the Moon Agreement, deal with uh, outer space and the celestial bodies. Is Mars, should Mars be treated differently than in the Moon? NASA's talking about asteroid missions. Uh, should the asteroids be treated differently, at least emotionally? We think of them differently, and we may have to have some sort of um, set of process, a set of rules that will deal with these. Um, we have environmental and planetary protection issues. Uh, we have some rules in space the scientists have worked on under COSPAR, and, but they're for biological contamination. Uh, we haven't solved some of the environmental issues and I mentioned Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty, which does deal with that, but in a very, very weak and way and without any way of truly enforcing any sort of regime. And of course, we have the disposal of materials. We've been up going to Mars for 30 years, Moon as well, uh, and we've left a lot of stuff there. If we bring humans to Mars, that raises a number of very interesting questions, uh, which I'm sure you can easily imagine yourself. The, um, in terms of anything else, there are ethical issues. There's one proposal, as you know, Mars One, to take um, uh, humans on a one -way, with a one-way ticket. How is the government going to react to that? Will they let it happen? Safety is another issue, of course. If we have disputes in space, we have no good process, particularly for international disputes. We need to do something there. And then if we someday colonize or have groups of people up there, they could make decisions on their own. And in fact, we've dealt with that with the space station. There is a code of conduct for the crew how does the crew, who, who determines the answers to issues, the controller on the ground or the head of the group in, uh, on the station? We will need similar types of uh, agreements, all doable, but we haven't addressed them yet. So in summary, there are no legal prohibitions in going to Mars with uh, taking humans up there, but there are questions. They need to be addressed, they need to be solved. We don't have to solve them today, we'll never solve all of them till we have people there. 
but we need to begin the process of thinking about them now. And I just would add at the end, environmental and other ethical issues may be much harder to solve than the uh, le pure legal treaty issues alone. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and I um, am an astrophysicist by training, but I um, really work on the carbon chemistry in the universe, and I work on a really very exciting topic, namely how to search for organics and also for life on Mars. And I am part of the NASA Astrobiology Institute, um, we have a team uh, under the lead of uh, Clark Johnson in uh, Wisconsin, uh, which was the title Habitability, Life Detections, and uh, looking for biosignature on terrestrial planets. A large team which is trying uh, to work on this really very uh, challenging topic. And you have heard this morning a wonderful talk uh, by Jim Garvin and also data by uh, Jim Green, and you will hear more uh, in the next days. Uh, the early evolution of Mars uh, has been very likely habitable. There was uh, liquid water on the surface, and there was the possibility that uh, life uh, has formed in the very early history of Mars. As you also know today, um, uh, the surface is dry, uh, impinged by UV photons, galactic cosmic rays. There is strong oxidation uh, in the surface. Uh, all uh, components which are destroying uh, organic molecules and are really hostile to life on the surface. So compared to Earth, what is really clear is that um, the identification of biomarkers is really extremely challenging, and what we estimate is a very, very low biomass, if at all, and when, then very localized. So it is rather difficult to look for uh, life on Mars, and um, you certainly need to uh, develop instruments which are capable of finding uh, the, needle, the needle in the haystack uh, in order uh, to be successful. There is certainly a consensus that ex uh, extinct life uh, is probably easier to find, but there are a lot of scientists uh, which are also proposed that there is uh, extant life somewhere in uh, some niches uh, on Mars which can uh, still be searched for, a particular, for instance, in caves, some talks you will hear about uh, tomorrow. So as we do now, uh, we are looking for biomarkers, biomarkers which we know from our genetic system, like for instance amino acids, nucleobases, simple hydrocarbons, uh, imaging methods are getting, and microscopic methods, instruments getting better and better, looking for microfossils. And if all that doesn't work, there's still the possibility to look what actually life does to its environment and to rocks, and we call that microbial catalysis where we can look for isotopic ratios on rocks and look uh, what if life was there in the past. So um, I just want to very, very shortly um, uh, uh, show you a little bit of the research which we are doing because uh, there are two questions. What should we actually be looking for? What can survive? What is stable uh, on close to the surface uh, of Mars? Um, because currently our instruments can only uh, survey this kind of terrain. And there are a lot of um, laboratory experiments which are done worldwide on looking for the stability of biomarkers, but also for microorganisms under Martian conditions, and in particular, how they withstand radiation. And uh, we are doing a lot of synfilm chemistry, and we are also exposing uh, these kind of uh, samples uh, on the International Space Station. And there is a large consor consortium which is actually European-led, but with the participation of the United States and uh, Russia on the exposed facility. Uh, which have been twice uh, um, uh, on board of the International Space Station as an external exposure facility, and we are just preparing uh, for the next um, 
uh, flight. This is exposed R2, as you can see it here, with many different experiments which are testing uh, and particular biomarkers and uh, a lot of microbes uh, in space environment. They will be exposed for approximately two years. Our launch date at the moment is 24 of uh, July uh, this year. And uh, the second question, which is very, very important, is how are we looking for those compounds which are stable, those microbes eventually which we think could survive? And this goes very, very much into instrument technology. And as I said before, you have really to look for the needle in the haystack. Uh, we have probably, uh, if, if life ever emerged there, or even if we are looking for meteoritic contribution, we have a very, very low amount of organics, which is embedded in a mineral matrix. And we have to try to get these few molecules out of the mineral matrix, so we have to extract them. And we, uh, there are many groups working how efficient uh, that could be made, how are uh, biomarkers binding to the minerals, how can we uh, get them out, how can we develop instruments uh, which are very efficient uh, in that, and really how can we concentrate those molecules so that we can identify them. So these are the topics uh, um, uh, my group uh, is working on. And uh, the last component, which is really, really crucial and which is also done, uh, performed worldwide, is field research in extreme environments on Earth, which are similar to Mars. Yeah, certainly many of you have heard, uh, have been to the Atacama Desert, and there are also other dry deserts, and Antarctica, where you can actually train and test your instruments and uh, try how to look for low uh, biomass or for low concentrations of organic molecules. And uh, we perform that in many different regions uh, uh, in the world. And there is a large consortium. People know each other and people exchange their knowledge. So that's also something which is very, very exciting uh, for students. And all that we do in order to prepare for future um, uh, Mars missions. And uh, since I'm one of the few Europeans at this conference, I, of course, because you get so many of the American missions, I have to uh, stress for ExoMars, and which will be the first mission which is going to drill two meter in the subsurface and taking uh, uh, samples and analyzing them uh, from, with many, many different instruments. And in order also to get ready for Mars 2020 and for other future missions, it is really important to do a combination of laboratory research, uh, space experiments on the International uh, Space Station, theoretical models, um, and field research, taking into account all these exciting data which are incoming all the time from the Mars missions in order to prepare for future Mars missions and for the ability to detect organic material on Mars. All right, I'm going to mix it up and stay over here and see if the lapel mic actually works and maybe get a little bit back into the light. Um, so I'm an aerospace engineer by training, so my presentation is going to be a little bit different, but my main focus right now is technology management in space agencies, trying to apply some of the theory from organizational studies to kind of the unique market that is aerospace. And what I'm going to do today is give a very brief overview of some of the work that my research group is doing and then highlight some of the more relevant points for you. I will say I don't study Mars at all, um, but I do think that some of the things that I will say will still be um, somewhat relevant. So I'd like to start my talks with this broad overview of why we're studying technology development, why we really need to understand what we're doing. And what it shows is the history of the emphasis of research and development money from NASA over time. Well, on the y-axis on the top, you have an emphasis on basic R&D, and on the bottom you have a basic, an emphasis on project-specific applied R&D with a goal. And what you see is that we've been going back and forth over time. And from an academic's perspective, what this means to me is that we still don't have a fundamental understanding of how to balance them. We keep realizing that we went too far in one direction or the other. And what we would do in my group is try to understand what's going on at a more basic level. So that broad motivation 
has us working on two main questions. We're interested in what the innovation ecosystem looks like right now. How do people actually do work? How do they develop new technologies? And also, from a management perspective, how can we change the system to make it better? And we do a lot of deep empirical studies, and we're also working on some new models to manage technology development better. Um, so to give you a sense of what we do, I'm gonna walk you through one of our case studies. This is one of the simpler ones so that it actually fits on a chart, and it'll give you an idea of the level of detail that we have, but also just how complex the dynamics are of both the technology development, how people are working, and how some of our management models don't really work as intended. So as I talk, I'm gonna overlay the story on this stage gate model, which is the way that we still generally think about technology development, concepts maturing in different buckets from concept to flight over time, and we make decisions about what to mature onto the next level. And the technology that I'm gonna be talking about is a detector for a particular kind of instrument that's useful for Earth observation. Um, so the story starts in the late 90s when there's a collaboration between NASA and an outside lab, and they start working on this new detector concept but leave it for a variety of reasons that have nothing to do with the feasibility of the technology. However, one of the key scientists at the outside lab is recruited to JPL and starts a small lab there. And they go on their merry way until about five years later, there's a NASA policy which emphasizes collaboration across the centers. And what this means is that all of a sudden we have two people at different centers who are interested in a very similar topic and it's reborn. And over the next six years, they keep working on this. They mature it to a point where they have a great prototype um, but without an immediate flight application, it shelved again. At this point, there's been a lot more work on it and they wanna get it back into the system. And they find a way through an SBIR contract with an outside contractor where they make tons of progress, but again, not recognizing the advocacy role that's important to keep these technologies alive, the project is shelved. Um, but at this point, they're able to keep the project alive by scrounging together resources from a number of different um, sources until three things happen. There's the confluence, of a new technical need arises, there's a mission that needs this instrument, that there's technical problems, they've had enough time that the communication of the capability is available, and there's some uh, water resources issues that create a political motivation to, to need this technology. And that creates the opportunity to fly this particular technology that had now been under development for more than 15 years outside of any project context. So what we learn from this is that the system doesn't work as we think it does. Like I said, this is the simplest version of the process, but also that there's a lot of factors that need to be considered. And we've done this now for about 15 different technology pathways in my group, and what we started to see is some common path pathways. For now, I'll just focus on four things that I'm gonna be so bold as to say are truths of this process. The first is it's never linear. We try to manage things in these buckets that we can define, um, but in none of the pathways that I've studied has there ever been a lack of these switchbacks in maturity that we expect to see. The second is that technology development always lasts longer than we think it does. We talk a lot about how long projects take, but we talk a lot less about how much time technology needs to spend maturing before it's ever even picked up by a flight project to be matured over the long time. And in my sample, it's never less than 14 years before it gets picked up by a project, which is quite a long time. The last is when we have these discrete markets, there needs to be a, a big interaction considered between how you sequence the missions, which are the opportunities that create the market for these technologies to be infused, and also the technology strategy. They can't be done independently. And last, we're learning a lot about how the way you structure your organization impacts the structure of the technology that you pr produce. And that seems to be one of the few ways that you can really control the process. So as I wrap up, I'll just highlight a couple of things that we're also working on in the group that are um, also relevant to this. So first, we're really interested in how we can use these more open methods, prizes and challenges to actually have meaning meaningful contributions to complex technologies. Um, we're interested, as I was talking about in the last bullet point before, about how the organization configuration can actually be a way that you influence the structure of the technology you're developing. Third, we're trying to capture some of these empirical insights to make models that do capture the interdependencies that you need to think about to be able to do the resource planning in this really complex environment. And last, we're interested in understanding the preference structures of people, because in an environment where you have such highly trained technologists and scientists that have so much discretion, you need to be able to understand how to align these incentives better. So I'll close by, um, showing all the students that have been helping me with this work and also thanking the sponsors that have made it possible. So 
figure I might as well keep doing the same thing that Zoe was doing, moving around a little bit. Um, as was mentioned before by Dr. Pace, my name is Chris Lanehart, and I'm an attending physician and assistant professor at George Washington University. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit now about aerospace medicine. And this is not something which GW has traditionally done, and when I first came here, it was something that I very much wanted to do, and Dr. Pace has been very supportive of that. Now, aerospace medicine as a specialty in medicine is a little bit strange. So when I go to space conferences, space people always wanna know why there's a doctor there. And whenever I go to medical conferences and I talk about space, they always wanna know why I'm talking about space. So basically, aerospace medicine, what it is historically is this laboratory. And it was a branch of preventative medicine that dealt specifically with the combination of physics and life support and medicine. And the purpose was to provide medical care and protect air crew passengers and patients in flight and in space. That's the historical definition. But getting training in aerospace medicine can actually be kind of difficult. And for anyone who's interested in it, sometimes you have to make your own path. And that's what I did. I did training in emergency medicine as my primary specialty. And then I did a lot of secondary training to try and build up aerospace medicine experience because it is a very small field. And it can be very difficult for people to get into, especially international folks, and I'm originally from Canada. So I did a lot of training with NASA and the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, I also have done uh, the Space Studies Program at the International Space University. Um, I am a reservist in the Royal Canadian Air Force as a medical specialist and I provide remote and telemedicine support to ships at sea and people in extreme environments or difficult environments. And last but not least, as you can see from the picture, I learned to fly planes. And to me, that was how I tried to build up this aerospace medicine experience. And when I try to put that into, uh, into practice, what we do here at GW is we focus on two things primarily. We focus on education and we focus on research. And the education that we do, folks, is basically two different things. One is a, a class that I teach here that tries to take non-medical people and teach them about how complicated it is to keep humans alive and healthy in space. But the other thing I do is I then try to take medical people and tell them a little bit more about how do you care for people in an extreme environment, in an austere environment with limited resources. And we have a fellowship that we do here for physicians that is designed specifically to focus on that purpose. Secondly, I am involved in a number of research areas, including uh, exercise countermeasures in microgravity and the role of footwear in that, radiation exposure and its effects on human biology for a mission to Mars or any long duration mission, and last but not least, the risk of decompression illness in space. No one wants to get the bends in space. So the future of aerospace medicine though is rather interesting because historically it was a branch of preventative medicine where we took care of the most heavily screened population on the surface of the planet. But the future of aerospace medicine is entirely different. The future of aerospace medicine is normal people going into space. And that means people that have medical problems, that take medications, that are older, people that we want to keep alive and healthy when they do their trip into space. And if Virgin Galactic currently has over 700 reservations for their flights, if Virgin Galactic is successful, they will fly more people into space than every space program in the history of humanity. Now the other thing about aerospace medicine which is changing is that we are now trying to go further again and it's one thing to provide medical care in low Earth orbit, where people have the possibility of coming home relatively quickly. But if you're three days away at the moon, or in orbit around the moon, or if you're months away en route to Mars, there is no coming home. So your medical care has to be completely autonomous, and they have to be able to do everything they need to do in that spacecraft. And so our, the way that we look at aerospace medicine is fundamentally gonna change in the next few years. Now, what I would encourage you all to do tomorrow, if you can, is to come out to the Biomedical Challenges panel uh, that I'm moderating. It'll be tomorrow afternoon. We're gonna talk all about the challenges of going to Mars, but we're also gonna talk about the solutions, because there are solutions to all of these problems. They just require the right amount of effort to find them. So it'll be myself, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer of NASA, someone from the Human Research Program at NASA, 
and a former astronaut and current president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation will be talking more about these issues in depth. And so I'd encourage you all to come out and be involved in our conversation. Thank you very much. Okay, and so I wanted to make sure we had uh, some time for, uh, for some uh, questions. Um, I should add, uh, both of my uh, opening sort of remarks, we also work with a number of other educational institutions around the world, uh, mention of the International Space University. Uh, we have a sister organization in uh, Vienna, uh, Austria, uh, the European Space Policy Institute. Uh, I'm currently working uh, with some people in the University of Tokyo, and we're looking to try to create a space policy organization uh, through a number of Japanese universities. Uh, we have a, uh, through uh, Dr. Hertzfeld's leadership, uh, we have ties with the Beijing Institute of Technology. They have a space law function there, and uh, which are, in many cases, are people that we've met uh, in international discussions, such as the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, uh, where we would meet with our Chinese and Russian uh, counterparts. So within the international community, uh, there's a number of other different mechanisms for extending the education and research work uh, that we try to do here. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention uh, is in terms of the kind of the coursework uh, that we do for the students. So we don't do a master's program in space policy. Rather, the students do a concentration of space policy within uh, a broader international science and technology policy program. So they're learning about S&T policy more generally. Some of them decide to concentrate in energy or IT uh, or environmental issues or development issues. Space, uh, of course, is a very popular one uh, by dint of the history that's been established here. Uh, we have a number of students from the engineering school who've come and have taken uh, those courses with us, uh, and we've also occasionally been able to send some of our students over the engineering school. Uh, their role is not to be engineers, their role is sometimes to do all, some of the ugly regulatory work uh, that needs to get done, export controls, spectrum licenses, intellectual property agreements, and so forth, uh, where space policy people can contribute uh, to those programs. So uh, with that, I wanted to know if, uh, if any of my colleagues had anything they wanted to add um, at this point. Any questions we can uh, take um, take from the audience? Ah, we have we have a volunteer. Hi, uh, I'm Layla Zucker. I'm an ER doc that trained here at GW. As a matter of fact, um, I'm also a round two uh, Mars One applicant. And I'm an admin on a Facebook page. We were talking about social media earlier and how you can get it, the word out, which has almost 7,000 people that basically like to just talk about how we're going to get humans to Mars. Um, three questions that you guys have touched on um, that come up over and over um, in the last year on the Facebook page are uh, people are always asking about radiation and how it's going to affect, which I'd obviously go to Chris, we'll do directed at him. Um, and, which I've a answered, but I'd like to hear what you have to say about it. Um, another question they ask is, if what's our responsibility ethically if we do find microbial life um, on Mars as to whether or not we have to be careful about contaminating the planet um, uh, while we're trying to scientifically observe it? Um, and the third is a space policy question which uh, is um, a lot of people bring up, well, and it was also mentioned earlier today, um, about uh, using nuclear uh, propulsion systems and whether or not that would be allowed under the space treaty. Okay. Um, okay on the radiation uh, question, uh, sure. Linhard, do you want to do that? And then on the uh, issue of micro mic microbial life and what our ethical responsibilities you know, might be, that might be something that Pascal or Henry could talk to. And I'll try to touch on nuclear power sources maybe at the end. Sure. Um, well, we will absolutely speak more tomorrow about, uh, about radiation. I think that the, the biggest question about radiation and the reason everyone's so concerned about it is that we don't have very good data in general. Um, and I think that the work that's been done trying to get more information from um, MSL and Curiosity to try and get a better idea of what the true radiation environment is, is very helpful. What's difficult, though, for us is that inherently space-based radiation is different from Earth-based radiation. And our knowledge of the effects, the biological effects of space radiation is extremely limited. 
And so ultimately, I think what we're going to find is the, we're going to find that there's probably a, a multifaceted solution to the issue. Um, it was interesting to hear this morning that the Institute of Medicine has given some ethical guidelines for how NASA can ease their restrictions um, with regards to the risk from space-based radiation. Uh, that will be one thing which I'm certain will be helpful. Um, but it would be really interesting and nice to be able to have a way to do better science looking at the biological effects of space-based radiation. And so long-term missions at the ISS can be of some help for that, but ISS is very much protected from most of the space radiation. So ultimately, we have to go beyond low Earth orbit with biological tissue to truly see what will happen to it. Let's go. Yeah, I could not, I'm, I'm somehow in a dead spot. I hear only echo. But uh, your question was, if we detect life on Mars, what kind of ethical responsibilities would we have? Yes. And it was not really about planetary protection or? Uh, no. No. Uh, well, I, I think that, um, to be honest, being an instrumentalist and uh, knowing how difficult it is, um, at the moment our instruments uh, can detect uh, organic compounds, um, where it is sometimes a bit difficult with the current instrumentation to uh, distinguish does it come from abiotic sources like from meteorites or could it actually be uh, life uh, uh, or uh, coming from life? So at the moment, I think our instrumentation is not yet so that we could really say that is life. In the future, there are a lot of instruments in development. We do hope uh, even if we will bring back a sample, of course, that would uh, uh, give us much more clarity because the instruments which we use on Earth are much more sensitive than the ones we can bring. No, uh, you will hear a panel tomorrow, I think, about um, all kinds of planetary protection and ethical constraints. Uh, however, um, I think un until this point, it will be um, always a bit ambiguous. And uh, when it is really so that we detect life on Earth, then um, there are some very, very interesting reports which deal with the fact how we inform people how we actually deal uh, with this kind of discovery. Uh, until then, I think it will, be, um, it will need a lot of cont control experiments in order really to be sure to, to say something. But uh, in the coffee break, I can give you some of the reports. Um, and actually, Margaret Race is in the room, uh, which has uh, done that, which deals exactly with, uh, uh, with that point <laughs> in very detail. <laughs> Um, and so with regard to uh, the nuclear power question, I, I think the, uh, sometimes I've run into the, uh, the perception that somehow nuclear power sources in space will be banned or limited or controlled in, in some way. Um, and that really isn't the case. And we have in the U.S., of course, we have a fairly rigorous process every time a nuclear power source is launched. Uh, it has to go through approval through the Office of Science Technology Policy Director or it can be kicked up to the president. Uh, over the last several years, there's been a rather extensive uh, negotiation of guidelines for the operation of nuclear power sources in space that has gone through the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, and it's gone through the Science and Technical Committee. So it's had some very good technical input, and it's been kind of a bottom-up approach of best, best practices. Uh, to simplify greatly, what it basically means is uh, don't turn on the reactor until you're heading away from Earth, um, and so that you minimize the chance of it uh, of a live reactor coming back uh, into the atmosphere. But operating a nuclear power source uh, on a planetary surface or certainly operating it for propulsion where you're, you're heading, heading away, uh, I think all of that is perfectly, uh, perfectly allowable. Um, I would have to probably uh, think a little bit uh, more if uh, there was a cycler spaceship design such as the ones that, uh, uh, that uh, Buzz has talked about. Um, I have to go back and look at that. Uh, but basically, if you, you simply want to minimize the chance that you would ever re-enter an uncontrolled live nuclear reactor uh, into the Earth's uh, biosphere, which is pretty, pretty reasonable. Uh, there are some countries that are still opposed. I won't say this is a unanimous uh, position. Um, I've had to uh, listen to many, several interventions from the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, opine on its views of nuclear power sources in space. My State Department colleagues are much more diplomatic than I am. 
uh, about that. But we have no major disagreements, I'm aware of, for example, with the Russians or the, or the Chinese. Uh, with regard, the second problem, though, is not so much policy, but really it's, it's time for so something, for a nuclear power source to be really reliable and safe to operate in space for a long period. You need a lot of experience with it. And that only comes from testing those materials over a long time. So you heard mention of the need to put biological samples out in deep space and get experience with galactic radiation. Uh, we also need to probably have uh, advanced radiation uh, exposures for materials that we're going to use in our power sources, not only in space, but also even on ground laboratories. So one of the long lead items for developing nuclear power source, whether for propulsion or power, uh, is going to be those materials. And really, we ought to be doing that now. If we, if, if we don't have enough money to build a nuclear rocket engine right now, um, I would argue that we probably should have some money set aside for doing long-term technology development, because some things will just simply take time. Um, and, uh, and if we want to have that option of a nuclear power source, we probably ought to be starting that research uh, or accelerating it now. Thank you very much. OK. We have time maybe for uh, maybe one more question, and I'll give some margin uh, back to, uh, to our programmers. Did somebody want to be brave? <laughs> Hello, I'm Gary Fisher. I'm a co-founder of Explore Mars. Um, this is perhaps more of a comment than a question. It, it concerns uh, law and the exploration of Mars, and particularly the Outer Space Treaty. We saw today several times um, a photograph taken of Earth as seen from the surface of Mars. And that perspective is the perspective of future inhabitants of Mars, that Mars isn't in outer space. Earth is in outer space. And I think they'll look at the Outer Space Treaty as something irrelevant and perhaps written by people with literally a different world view than they have. So I'm just wondering, you know, how do you think that might play out uh, in the future? Thank you. The Outer Space Treaty uh, goes back to the 1960s and, uh, of course, in the height of the Cold War where the United States and the Soviet Union were the only two nations with access to space. Uh, although it is a UN treaty, it's been ratified by, uh, or signed by close to 130 nations. And the specifics of it could be controversial to some people on certain issues. I mentioned a couple when I was uh, speaking. But the basic principles, I think, will survive, and, I, the, we, and it is the master document and the only thing we have right now, really, in international law, specifically on space. Principles such as peaceful purposes, using space um, for scientific exploration, um, encouraging international cooperative programs, not putting weapons of mass destruction in space. Um, th these are principles. And uh, they're ideals, and I think they will survive, even though we are going to have to get a little more practical about certain um, areas once we begin, uh, which we already have begun, to uh, do more in outer space than just take pictures and uh, look around. I'm thinking about commercial proposals and uh, as well as government exploration. Um, so, and particularly if we go back to the moon first, there are a number of near-term questions about who gets to use what and when uh, up there. Nonetheless, I don't think that um, the Outer Space Treaty is irrelevant when you look at it at its broadest objectives and, uh, and the underlying uh, coordination with the UN Charter, which is oriented toward, at least working towards international peace, even if we don't always get there. Okay. With that uh, hopeful note, let me uh, uh, pause and let me uh, really thank our panelists for the discussion. And if any of you want to have uh, more detailed discussions one-on-one -on -one with uh, what in the world is going on at uh, GW particularly, or if you're here uh, in town, and our contributions to uh, human exploration in space and Mars in particular, uh, please come and see us at the receptions. Thank you. <laughs>